Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric and Matt, and this is Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit, your beacon of freedom and the American way of life. Tune in every Friday for a new episode as we dive into the world of liberty and what makes our country great. All right, guys, welcome back. It's another great week here, and we have an awesome, awesome episode this week. Love it. We hope that everybody has done well and has been safe in their travels. And oddly enough, today's episode is about being safe in your travels. And this is going to be the road ready mindset. Mindset is the name of today's podcast. And we're going to dive into some of the things you probably want to, you know, take into consideration when traveling. Um, primarily for the purposes of this podcast, I would say more along the lines of like being in your vehicle and traveling right. around the country or taking a trip out of town or something like that. Yeah. Not necessarily like going abroad all around the world or anything. This is mainly uh, just traveling around here in the yeah. U.S. Traveling to visit family. The holidays are coming up. So there's going to be a lot of travel, long distance road travel, overnight you know, stay. So I think this is the perfect time to hit on this subject because a lot of people and myself included will be traveling, you know, to all different types of states. Uh, but first, guys, I hear the message. Everybody loves the hat. I see the comments. Where can I buy the hat? Matt, you can't wear the hat anymore because I don't know where to buy it. Guys, if you just go to ballisticinc.com and in the search bar type, we the people, you'll see all the We The People stuff pop up. And the hat will be there. Buy it if you like it. Or don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. If you want a We The People hat, you can support the podcast and go pick yourself up a We The People hat. That's right. All right. Before we get started with today's podcast, I'd like to thank our friends at My Patriot Supply for supporting LLP. In the coming years, things are going to be getting really crazy. Are you ready? Do you have a plan in case of food shortages, power outages, emergency evacuations? You should always prepare before these things strike. That's why we recommend getting your emergency food from My Patriot Supply. They're America's number one preparedness company with several million happy, well-prepared customers. Their food lasts up to 25 years in storage. It's like a survival insurance policy that you can eat. When you need it, it will be there. Right now, you'll save $100 on a three months emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Go to the link below or go to www.mypatriotsupply.com forward slash LLP. You'll receive a $100 discount off a three month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply. Check them out and tell them we sent you. So, um, you know, Chad and I did a gun gripe not too long ago. And at this point in the timeline, I'm not sure if that one's going to be up before the podcast goes up. Uh, but Chad and I did an entire gun gripe episode just on road guns and uh, sort of the mindset of, uh, well, we called it truck guns, but sort of the mindset of a, what, what a truck gun is, you know, a, 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 via, a gun that you keep in your vehicle for just readiness purposes. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you need to protect yourself while you're out on the road. Um, this particular podcast, we will talk a bit about road guns briefly, but I really want this to be more of a holistic approach to some of the things you might want to generally have uh, ready and some of the considerations. So, you know, as we said in the intro, it is a mindset, right? Uh, being ready when you're out on the road uh, most certainly is a mindset you have to put yourself into. You know, it's it's one thing if you're sitting at home on your couch, hanging out with the family, watching a movie or whatever, there's a certain amount of reaction that you're going to have to a situation that might happen to you when you're just home with your family or doing your thing. I mean, there might be a very limited scope in terms of the amount of things that could happen that would disrupt your everyday home environment, right? Short of someone breaking into your property or, you know, trying to break into your home and do something. Generally, our home is our castle, right? So when you're right. home, it's much easier to kind of relax a little and kind of be yourself. You don't really have to be so worried about every little thing that's going on. It seems like when you're out on the road, though, it really is a little bit of a different situation because you are amongst all the general populace. You're not in the safety of your home. Now, you know, in many states, uh, Castle Doctrine laws also apply to your vehicle as being um, an extension of your home. Uh, so now from a legal perspective, sure, they may view your vehicle as being an extension of your home, 
but it is not really your actual home. I mean, it's a very limited space that you can uh, have at your disposal um, for having the things that you might need to be comfortable, to secure yourself, uh, to keep your vehicle in good operating order, and to be generally more prepared for any bad situation that might happen. You do have a limited amount of real estate in terms of your vehicle, especially when you're traveling with your kids. That's right. And they got all their random bags. And, you know, of course, the wife brings along every random thing. And you got all your luggage if you're taking a trip. So that makes your available space even less. Mm -hmm. So you have to really capitalize on the space you have to sort of make those things blend in and not be seen, so to speak. So... Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, in this episode, um, I mean, yes, that we this is we're a gun channel, but you know, hopefully, this episode will kind of extrapolate on just you know traveling and that mindset in general, not just on guns. And while that will be a, a talking point, I don't think it's going to be the main subject. Um, especially, I mean, and just to get it out of the way, you know, when you're traveling with like firearms, like you said, you have limited real estate, and you know, like me personally, I carry appendix. Going on a long road trip in appendix is like it's not comfortable. Like you're gonna want to take it off, but then you have limited space on where you can put it. You have your kids in the back, so you have to be mindful of their reach, where they're putting their hands. You've heard the news stories about oh, the little kid reached in the mom's purse and you know shot her in the back while she's driving because she didn't think to hey remember there's a kid back there and they have hands and they have curiosity. So be mindful of that. Um, but if we're just looking at the the entire high level overview of traveling firearms probably don't doesn't really register to me you know, like on one of the considerations because i'm going to take it i already know but what else am i going to do what else am i to what else am i going to do outside of the firearm because that's such a small portion of the overall aspect of traveling with your family um you know I would probably say making sure, and this goes back to Atlanta. Atlanta about four years ago had a really bad snowstorm where you know people were stuck on the highway for eight hours. They're running out of gas because the highways aren't moving. Um, people are getting out and walking on the side of the highway. So I think it's very important just to make sure if you're traveling, make sure you have water and food in the trunk. Like not like just a small portion, like go to Costco or Sam's and buy a, a 24 pack of water. It's I think the 24 pack is like three dollars and 25 cents you can buy some snacks and food because you had infants and babies that didn't have food the moms didn't have milk or any formula to give to them so take those kind of considerations especially when traveling you know long distances so that's something i would probably think of first is making sure that my family inside of my dwelling the car is you know sufficient i can self-sustain in that vehicle yeah, I mean, I, th I think that there's a couple of different ways to look at it. You know, there, there's certainly a group of people that would probably go, okay, well, I'm going to take a long trip somewhere. So I think I'll, you know, put maybe a folding PCC with a brace on it or something mm -hmm. in my, uh, you know, uh, my suitcase or something just so it's sort of hidden and, and back there and I have it when I, when I, you know, get to where I'm going or whatever. And then there might be the, the group of people, which I probably fall more into this category where, you know, I generally have my truck kind of kitted out in the way I want it all the time. And right. that way, whatever other things that just are intrinsically going to go along with me, like you're not going to go everywhere all the time with all of your luggage and your extra things that, you know, you would take to it for a long trip. Mm -hmm. So I sort of have the everyday uh, preparedness that's just sort of there and intrinsically a part of, of what I do every single day. And then there's sort of the, the stuff that gets added in for a long trip. Um, generally speaking, I think that most people um, every single day when they're just out and about in their every everyday life, they probably don't think about food in their um, vehicle, you know, and having that stuff on tap, water in their vehicle, um, I think it's important to have a couple of like additional fleece blankets, maybe a, oh, yeah. at least one change of clothes for each person, an extra pair of shoes uh, and everything. Part of my um, thought process there is blankets are not only useful to keep you warm if you need to stay warm in the cold, like you mentioned, but also someone might be in shock. You might witness a car accident and someone's in shock. You need to wrap them up and keep them warm. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of reasons. Um, like, Walmart sells those little $5 fleece blankets that come in the little roll. And sometimes, well, they're probably not $5 anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> but I remember at one point, I think I bought them on sale for like $4.99. They were, you know, on sale. 
but you can get the little cheaper uh, fleece blankets at Walmart. And I generally will buy quite a few of those and I just stuff them in my vehicle anywhere I can put them and I carry way more than I'm going to need. Uh, I know I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again for folks that have never tuned in to some of the gun gripe episodes. Um, in our truck gun video, Chad and I actually, um, I, I told this particular story in that in that uh, gun gripe, but I'm going to just briefly tell it again just to drive the point home on Give the blankets. The cliff notes. Yeah, and why I think it's so important. Um, I was actually passing through town up here uh, in the town I live in, and um, there was a, a vehicle collision, an accident. And a young lady was out there by her vehicle. Now, she wasn't hurt, and nobody in the vehicle was hurt, and the other people in the other vehicle weren't hurt, but the cars were pretty trash. Like, she couldn't just leave, right? They were still assessing the situation, loading up the wreckage, what have you. And she was literally just in her uh, pajama pants, you know, basic house shoes, a T-shirt, not set up for cold weather at all. And it was like 28 degrees outside, definitely cold enough to be really uncomfortable. I pulled over. I had a quantity of my spare fleece blankets that I always carry. I was able to give her those blankets, and then she could stay warm, and I went about my way. I mean, sure, I gave her those blankets. Yeah, it cost me a little money, but when you can look out for people, I think it always does a solid by other folks because, you know, someone might be thinking, well, you know, that that dude as a gun owner, you know, maybe they're not jerks, right? It, right. it, it helps pay it forward to people. And it's just doing the right thing, right? So you never know if someone else might need a blanket you can help out. Maybe they're in shock. Maybe they're cold. Or maybe the kids get cold, you're in the car. Or look at that snowstorm, right? You run out of fuel, and you got to be able to stay warm. So having blankets is important. Another reason I like having those blankets in my vehicle, especially for long trips, is let's say that you're carrying a rifle case or you're carrying some guns in your vehicle. You need to hide them a little bit better. Um, that's a great way to just drape over the belongings in your vehicle and hide them. I generally buy the blankets that are the most girly, gaudy looking ones I possibly can. I don't buy the manly ones. Don't buy the camo ones and the deer heads and all mm -hmm. that. Get the ones that have just got the cartoon characters in pink and the, the frozen one. Yes. You get, know? <laughs> get the most girly looking blankets you can. You don't want to get anything that screams guns or manly because I mean, you want to be able to hide things and just they make know. it look like there's nothing there really worth taking, right? Mm -hmm. So always think about that. I guess that's one thing we can kind of talk about is the aspect of thievery. It certainly is a greater consideration when you're traveling, right? A lot of thieves are looking for an easy mark. They're looking for out-of-town tags because they're looking for someone who's outside of their comfort zone. They're outside of the realm of knowing like who is a threat and who isn't. They don't know anybody in that town. They don't know who's known for breaking into people's cars or not. They don't know if the police are looking for that guy for thiev thievery or if he's wanted, right? They look for an out-of-town tag because uh, someone from out of town can be taken advantage of. Right. So I always try to think that that's probably my number one consideration when I'm traveling. Other than carrying guns and having my road guns and things like that in terms of just the protection of my vehicle and my person and you know, the abodements that I occupy when I'm on the road, I always think, all right, how, where can I park my vehicle where someone's not going to try to break in it? You know, I'm always trying to think, what would a thief think? And I try to sort of circumvent that. Like I look for good lighting in the parking lot, that sort of thing. So oh, yeah. That's something to consider. So you, you're considering more on the um, making sure you're parking your vehicle in the in the safe spot, being more aware of what's in your vehicle so you don't become a victim. Um, I'd like to talk about things that you should pack in your vehicle once you've started this road trip. So once you're on the road and you're traveling, um, one big thing that people have put a lot of faith in is fix a flat. Um, they're like, oh, if I get a flat tire, I'll just use fix a flat. Well, you can, and I'm not, I'm not saying fix a flat doesn't work, um, if you have a complete blowout, obviously it's not going to work. There's no tire left, but there are times where you, you want to use your spare tire. And that is if you want to save the tire, if you have a puncture, Eric, or you have like a small hole, once you put that fix a flat in the tire, it's done. Like you're not, they're not going to repair the tire. You have to buy a new tire. So if, if you can save that tire, save it to change it, put it in the back, put your spare tire on. Once you get to a tire place, they can plug it for like $25. Like a yep. $25 repair will save you. I don't know what tires you guys are running. I'm running Toyo uh, Open Countries, 
$500 tires. Like I'm not going to throw my tire away with fix a flat. I'm going to have them plug it if they can and we're good. You know, I think there's also an aspect of disruption of your trip. I mean, there's nothing more inconveniencing to you mm -hmm. than to have a disruption because you've had a flat or some type of an issue. And that all comes down to like making sure before the trip that you've properly prepared. Like you check your air pressure in your tires, you check for wear and damage, you make sure you're keeping your tires rotated. All of those things notwithstanding, I am a huge fan of just a good, solid tire repair kit that I keep in my vehicle. Yep. Plug um, it I yourself. keep a little military canvas uh, tool bag, and I've got all different types of tools just in case I might run into an issue while I'm out on the road. But also, all right, I carry an impact. I carry a DeWalt impact, and I use the impact as a 20 volt impact. And I actually use the sockets that work on my. You know, I, I have the socket set up for my tire lugs, mm -hmm. so I can go out there and, grr, grr, and and take them off if I need to. But also, what I've got is a drill bit holder that I fashioned up for my impact mm -hmm. um, that actually uses. Um, so I know you've seen those uh, those little poker things that you've got in your uh, in your tire blowout kit that you kind of open up the hole so you can fit the rubber patch in there yeah. when you're when you're plugging a tire. Like a corkscrew almost. That's like a corkscrew. I fashioned one up to work on my impact. Oh, so nice. once I get the the obstruction out of the tire, all right, and you can and I keep a little a little tiny spray bottle of eyeglass cleaner and I mix a little bit of Dawn dish detergent in there mm -hmm. so I can just go and you can see it bubbling out. The dish detergent makes it bubble. Yep. And you literally take your impact and go and run it back and forth and it just drills it out nice and then you just boop i can patch a tire or plug a tire in no time so having those little hacks like that mm -hmm. those little life hacks that can save you time especially if you've got a young child like you do yep. and you're traveling on the road it can make life a little easier when someone's you know the, the kids gonna be going well what's going on why are we stopped or I have to go to the bathroom, I'm and now hungry. it's like, oh, man, I'm we've got bored. a blown tire, yeah. and the kid's hungry. She's got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so the little hacks like that that can help save you time on the road, especially when you're traveling with youngsters, is always going to go a long way. I mean, I know some folks that have big trucks will even carry an actual full-on floor jack with them in their vehicle, especially if they've got a big tool, back, yep. uh, tool, tool box in the back of their truck. Uh, I've known of, uh, of guys to have a full-on... Mm -hmm. you know, jack, floor jack in their vehicle. Yep. Um, and I mean, lots of times people aren't considering, so I'm really glad you brought that up. You know, I I don't drive a lifted truck. Um, I do have some ground clearance on my vehicle. I don't require a special jack, but lots of times if you have like, you know, a six inch lift, you have to have a higher, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, but it's a special lift that's going to lift that truck up. And if you don't have that with you, then you're not gonna be able to change your tire. Yep. What the problem that I have is that the the rims that I'm using require a thin wall socket. So if you had a standard wheel socket, it won't fit. So even if I wanted to change my tire and I didn't have my thin wall socket, I couldn't get my wheel off. Mm. So, you know, and I'm actually just thinking about this, so I'm glad. Now I have to go and put a thin wall socket in in the tray of my trunk so that way I can get my wheel off if I need to. Well, let me tell you another hack. Okay, so you know the little scissor jacks that come with your vehicle, the one that you got to take the little thing, put the poles together, and you do this number? Yeah. Um, you can actually take an old screwdriver bit if you run a drill like I am, like one of the 20 volt, uh, 20 volt DeWalts, mm -hmm. if you will. You can actually just make yourself a bit that'll work in your impact or in your drill, and you can just go... Brrr, and nice. it'll just... Very it nice. Saves you a ton of time and a ton of effort when you're on the side of the road. So those little effort-saving hacks are certainly useful when it comes to you know even just changing tires on the side of the road mm -hmm. um things like that certainly a viable option so when we're talking about things we want to pack before we take a trip uh the way we want to have our vehicle kitted out before we want to take a trip that is certainly a huge consideration because you don't want to have to inconvenience yourself in a real terrible way imagine not being able to change a tire at all and then now you're having a call help on the side of the road and they could be hours away and now you've put yourself back and inconvenienced yourself and there's also an additional security issue that you have to keep in mind now you're in a potentially compromised situation you're broke down on the side of the road what if a dishonest person would try to take advantage of you or your family mm -hmm. come by and try to cause you harm or rob you or or anything right so 
You're oh, putting that help, ball in then, someone else's court yeah. when it shouldn't be. You're in control of that situation, but if you don't have the means to deal with the situation, you're not in control. You've now relinquished control to mm-hmm. an unknown party. You don't know if they're there to help or not. So that's very uh, something very consider you know yeah. a, an important consideration to keep in mind. Well, that makes me think. You know, imagine you have a, a nicer vehicle and you're on the side of the road and cars are driving by, but then you have a car pull over that's, you know, wanting to help. And you have three dudes jump out of the car and they start walking towards you. You know, it puts you in a weird situation because they could say, hey, we're just trying to help. But then you kind of have this underlying, like, I'm going to have three guys walk up on my car and under the guise of helping, you're going to get intimately close with me. That's right. And then you're kind of point past that point of no return. So... You know, those are the, some of the safety considerations you have to, you know, consider. That's is, right. Are you going to let these people get within striking distance of you because they could help you? Or do you just say, hey, guys, it's OK. I called help. You know, I, I'm good. Get back in your vehicle. We're good. And, yep. you know, that those are things that you have to worry about. I mean, people think, oh, it won't happen. But it does, because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be talking about it. And that's why it's important to carry guns when you're on the road. You know, mm-hmm. even if it's just a pistol on your person. You're going to be in much better situation to deal with any potential issue when you're out on the road. Now, one quick little caveat I want to bring up is also understand that when you're traveling through various states, that each state has their own individual laws when it comes to you know how they, they dictate how guns are carried and used in their states. Yep. And not every state has reciprocity with the state that you might be from. So you're beholden to the laws that exist in the state you're traveling through. And I know that sucks, but like, say it's a long trip and you're taking, you know, a, you're, you're crossing 10 state lines during the trip. Well, each of those states have their own individual laws that dictate what you can and can't do. And you have to be knowledgeable of those. So keep that in mind as well. Um, I'm going to sort of segue into a, uh, another little hack here. Uh, one thing that I like to do for the road as well, not only prior to a long trip, but just, this is one of my general everyday practices for my vehicle. Um, I like to take a, a decent sized backpack and I like to keep it loaded down with all kinds of useful goodies and it stays in my vehicle all the time. All right. Uh, we'll go through a, a few of the contents, but no matter what the contents are, f- for the purposes of what I'm getting at here, the contents are kind of irrelevant. Just make sure you've got a pack with useful things in it that sort of stays in your vehicle and it becomes a part of your vehicle at all times. Now, we'll go over some of the things that you might keep in your vehicle, Matt. I generally keep in my little backpack, I keep a good solid blowout kit with a couple of tourniquets in it. I keep a bunch of drink powders that are the electrolyte drink powders. I believe they're the Pedialyte uh, drink powders. Are they? Yeah, I think they are the Pedialyte powders. You can add the water for electrolytes. I carry two Pedialytes ready to go in each of the pouches on the outside. I carry probably about... 24-hour ration worth of food and snacks for two or three people. You know, definitely enough to feed two or three people um, for a day. If you get stranded somewhere, you know, someone mm-hmm. gets hungry, you need a snack. I carry food and that sort of thing. Um, also, I forget the name of them, but they're, they are these little towel pucks. Have you ever yes, seen them? Yes, those were awesome. Aren't remember? they cool? Yes, you put yeah. some water on it. It's you take just a little bit of water and you put it on the little puck and poof, you've got a... Full, yeah, towel. it's like a full size. Like they're they're pretty big. They're massive. Mm-hmm. I mean, we went out camping with them. We were using them just to you know wash with. Yeah, and they're not like flimsy. They're they're yeah, full I mean, on they're, like cloth. Yeah, yeah, they're literal literal cloth. But those uh, little rags are great. You know, mm-hmm. maybe your kid spills something, or you just need to clean yourself up a little bit. Or in an emergency, let's just say from a medical perspective, they do yeah. come in handy if you need to get something quickly to clean up a wound or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, so they have a lot of different uses, that sort of thing. Also, I carry water purification tablets uh, in my little pack in my vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I also carry a good survival knife. I've got fire making equipment. Um, it's actually one of the Blackbeard fire starters. Okay. Um, yes. They sell a pack called the Captain's Plunder. They've got a couple of different ones, a Captain's Loot, Captain's Plunder, but the Plunder bag is their full kit. Um, that actually has all the fire starter sticks in it. They call them black beer because they, they're black. Okay, mm-hmm. and, and when you pull them apart, they look like a beard. 
uh, but it's a really, really viciously awesome fire starting material. I mean, you can cut off just a piece of that rope that big and fluff it up, and it's got a uh, magnesium rod in there, and you can start a fire with next to nothing. It doesn't matter if it's wet or anything. Uh, if you use the code IV8888, you can actually receive yourself a discount with Blackbeard Fire Starter if you decide you want to order a Blackbeard uh, product. Just Bing. shameless plug, but keep that in mind. If you do use my code, you can get a discount over there. But anyway, I, I think it's important to be able to start fire, stop bleeding, feed someone if they need it, and then also hydrate yourself. Those are some pretty important considerations. Right. I'm going to go over some other stuff, but I'm curious to hear what you have in, in your type of bag that you would carry. Well, um, I don't have the I don't have nearly the same amount of like medical stuff. I have a small med kit. It's nothing like a trauma kit. It's you know more like a bump, scrape, bruise type kit. Um, Super so, important. Yeah, I probably do need to reevaluate my trauma kit. Um, but I do have, and I'll tell you, um, if you have an Audi Q5. Limited space. If, it, 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 I mean, it's a medium size SUV. If you go to the back on the trunk, there's two hooks on each side. I can tell you they work perfectly for holding body armor with a full combat load with the carry handle so you can hang it up and it'll just sit there the entire time. You don't need any special equipment. Um, and then if you lift up where the spare tire is under that little concealed compartment and you pull out the, uh, the tray that is like an organizational tray, you can actually lay, uh, an AR 15 perfectly sideways in that container and then fold the floor down and you won't even know it's there. And that, for me, that's my perfect travel, you know, setup. I have my rifle, I have my body armor sitting in the back. I have low tent going around the passenger side back and the pa and the back window, so you can't see in. Um, my front two windows are legal, so um, you can see in, but you can't really see what's in the back. Um, so that's my loadout for weapons. Uh, I do carry water. I do carry uh, some food and snacks but I don't carry anything nearly at the same level uh, as Eric as far as like water purification tablets and all that good stuff. So, um, you know, I'm, if I'm going to, I am planning some travel up to North Carolina to visit some family. So I probably will put a little bit extra in that road trip, but I did get stuck on the road uh, four years ago in Atlanta with the snow and my wife got stuck in the snow and her boss that lives in Ackworth, he had to get out and walk like five miles to get home, to finish that that last little bit to mm. get home in the snow. I was like, man, And that's if you're rough. not used to that, that, that could be kind of well, scary. You have to think they are coming from an office environment. So they did not have winter clothes. They had mm. dress shoes on, which are like thin leather shoes, no grip on it. So imagine trying to walk on an icy, snowy highway with yeah. like in, in business, you know, like business attire. That's you know? scary. So... What you were talking about kind of got my juices flowing and, and gave me some food for thought. And ultimately, that's what today's podcast is really about, right? It's for us to reevaluate, you know, our personal ways that we approach being prepared on the road, but also to kind of springboard off of each other in terms of ideas and see if we can come up with some better ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about, like, say, your body armor and your rifle, it got me thinking, well, gosh, my battle belt uh, achieves a few things, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you if you had any medical on your body armor. I'm sure you've at least got a couple of T's, right? Yes. Yeah. So see, even though you got the boo-boo kit, you still yeah. have at least a few tourniquets on your, on your armor. Um, the battle belt is a great option because this is a relatively compact setup. And what it allows you to accomplish, I mean, you see I've got a couple of extra rifle magazines. I've got a couple of extra pistol magazines. Got my SIG M17. But short of the immediate defensive capabilities that I have with this battle belt, what do you also notice that I've got? I've got two tourniquets, a complete blowout kit that's ready for bear, medical shears, and a multi-tool, right, with a seatbelt cutter on it, okay? So... When you think about it, this is actually the majority of this is medical and, and being able to deal with those types of situations out on the road, right? Uh, if I have, let's just say, a 12 and a half inch AR 
with a good flashlight on it, run it loud, no can, nothing like that, no crazy triggers, just a good, basic, no frills, all business AR that's mm -hmm. ready for the road. I can take this battle belt and I can unbuckle it. With his Cobra buckles. With the Cobra buckle. And I can lay this bad boy flat and it will store relatively compactly in a vehicle somewhere. So even if you're running a small SUV or something like a Honda Pilot, a Honda Pilot mm -hmm. that we um, affectionately call Gandalf the White, yep, the or battle, White Honda the Pilot, buggy. there is plenty of room for me to totally hide this battle belt and a rifle out of, out of view. And I've got medical on my person as well as my additional blowout kit and my, my little pack with the food and the medical supplies we talked about. Mm -hmm. I like having multiple medical options set up in a wide variety of different areas because I never know. All right, so if I have to don this belt and go deal with the situation, I know I've got medical on me. But I also know that back at my vehicle, there's always going to be medical there. So if I have to tell someone, run back over there and go grab that bag, or hey, take that bag and go over there, I can have medical where I might happen to be, and then medical can also go somewhere else if I need it to be. Because really, at the end of the day, if there is a disastrous situation on the road, let's just say that it's not even involved with guns, and let's just say someone's been hurt or injured or there's some uh, injury, right? You're going to stand a much higher chance of needing to save someone than you are. You're going to have to deal with, with a wound or, or, or a medical situation much sooner than you're going to have to deal with the potential of, of hurting someone. That's right. You need to be prepared to protect yourself but that's not necessarily going to be the M.O. It's really, for the kind of world we live in, we're, we're going to be probably needing to save someone in, in, in a disastrous situation. That's right. And so I just, was, just, It just made me think about that. When you mentioned the armor, I just want to mention the yeah. battle belt. And on, on an armor note, if you go to RMA Armor <laughs> and use the code IV8888, you do get 10% off. 10%? 10%. All right, site wide, um, but uh, I digress. Um, when you hit on something that you know is very important is when you're traveling across state lines with weapons, mainly like your your concealed carry pistol. There are some states that have reciprocity. Reciprocity doesn't mean that you can drive through the state and and carry however you want. They still have specific laws. So like South Carolina, North Carolina, they have laws that say, hey, even if you're traveling through the state, you have to have that firearm in the trunk. You might be able to conceal carry once you get out of the vehicle, but in the vehicle, from what I was able to, uh, what I was able to find by doing some research is, you have to have that firearm out of your arm's reach or secured in the back where you can't reach it. And that's why you're driving. But once you get out, um, you know, your reciprocity is good. You can carry it wherever. North Carolina has an open carry with a uh, rest. Like you don't even need a permit with open carry. So beyond, you know, knowing the different laws and, and, and mm -hmm. all of the different types of reciprocities and, and each state's laws and everything, I think we've pretty much satisfied the overall thirst for, you know, what type of guns we might want to carry on the road. If you want to learn more about that, go over and check out our gun gripe on road guns because we went over this for like 45 minutes straight, just Chad and I there. Um, so I think we covered like, you know, the blowout kits and the medical as being a super, super important component. The firearms are a very super important component to self-preservation. Uh, we talked about food a little bit. We talked about, you know, caring for your vehicle on the road, making sure you can keep your vehicle on the road. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it goes without saying that obviously like certain medications you want to make sure you carry, that goes without saying. I mean, you're not going to leave home without your medications and things like that. Um, you know, overall, I think that people tend to not really think as much about the medical end of things. And also it's a mindset. As we said in the very beginning of the podcast, that your mindset has to sort of evolve and change for what is going on in the situation. You have to change your mindset to that of a little bit more of a survival mindset. You know, when mm -hmm. you're out on the road, think about even just driving, right? You drive offensively versus defensive driving, right? Be, you know, having a much better um, situational awareness, right? You're making sure that if someone didn't change lanes properly, they're not going to hit you. I mean, so avoiding a potential issue before it becomes an issue 
becomes probably even more important mm -hmm. than reacting to something after it's already happened. If a bad situation has happened, is that to say that you couldn't have done something to prevent it in the first place? Yeah, and I think a lot of that has, and I mean, I see this all the time because, you know, I drive quite a bit. You see so many cars that are just, they let their ego get the best of them. And you'll see it, like you'll be in the left lane and you see these two cars just kind of going at it. And I mean, I just get out of the way, man. And then down the road, you see them just, you know, jacking around with each other, cutting each other off. And I'm like, especially during the holidays, you don't want to get caught up in that. Just let, let the ego go, switch lanes, get into the middle lane or even the right lane, the slow lane, and let those you know clowns go by. Because right. all that's going to do is get you into trouble and, you know, it happens. I see it all the time. I'll see a yeah. car speed by and then maybe like three or four miles down the road, you'll see him, a, a car accident or a police officer. So, you know, with me personally, I always take the mindset of when I'm traveling with my family is, you know, I'm not trying to get there fast. If you plan accordingly and you leave when you're, when, when you don't miss movement, as they say, if you say, Hey, we're leaving wheels up at, at nine o'clock and you hit the road at nine and you plan accordingly, you don't have to speed, just relax, take it easy. And, and you get there when you get there. And, and I, that's served me very well. I think it's really easy for people to get complacent mm -hmm. when they're out on the road. And that could even just be a simple pit stop, right? You know, you're making this just casual stop at the gas station to fuel up and go to the bathroom or whatever. You know, lo and behold, someone neglects to lock their car. And that's how kids get kidnapped. That's how vehicles have uh, guns stolen out of, the, out of the vehicle. That's a big one, yeah. That's how vehicles get stolen. That's how adults get kidnapped. I mean, all of these terrible things can happen when they think that you're at a moment of comfort and they're going to take advantage of that moment of comfort where, you know, they, they know that people are going to be a little bit mildly complacent. So those little short interactions, those short stops at the gas station or the restaurant, mm -hmm. you have to be on your toes and just keep your eyes about, you know, be kind to everybody, but also have a plan uh, to deal with the absolute worst of every person that could potentially come out. Again, these are strangers. These aren't people you know. So you always have to just approach with a little bit of caution in that regard. Now let's talk about point A to point B. All right, now we've 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 gone through every bit of preparation we possibly can. We've grabbed everything but the kitchen sink to take on the road with us. Mm -hmm. And we have inevitably forgotten something because we always do. Oh, every time. <laughs> All right, now we are getting where we're going. Let's say we're going to check into a hotel. We're going to check in somewhere. Let's just, for the purposes of this argument, let's say that we're talking just an average uh, hotel, your days in or whoever, right? doesn't matter. Whatever hotel. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive hotel or a cheap hotel. Let's just say whatever lodging uh, you're going to call home, let's just say even for the night. Mm -hmm. Overnight, you're, you're stopping somewhere to stay, and then you're going to head out the next morning or whatever. Where I see a lot of people making mistakes, too, is not only do they not park their vehicle in a, in a secure location with plenty of lighting, which of course, if it's a packed out hotel, it can be difficult for you to, to take the primo spots that are near lights and near exits and things like that, right. which I always try to, you know, don't park all the way at the back of the parking lot in the, in the dark alley near mm -hmm. the back of the parking lot. The I mean, back left corner. Yeah, yeah, way back. Or, you know, you look at the security cameras. That's what I always do. I'll look at where the security cameras are looking. And I'm not going to park my vehicle where the cameras aren't looking That's or where right. there's not light or where there's not an exit nearby. So always think about what's my exit strategy when I'm entering this situation with my vehicle and parking for the night. How am I going to leave? How am I going to exit? How am I going to escape? So I'm always thinking about how I'm going to leave, not how I got there. But that's part of it. And then another mistake I see people making all the time, and I've seen it, like hanging out in hotels and stuff like that. You know, you see someone going through the lobby with a giant gun case with gun stickers yes. all over it, and they yep. got their 511 tactical bag and their, you know, their all their tactical jeans. bridges yeah. and, 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 and combat boots, and they're not police, they're not military, they're just Joe Blow. And I get it. Like, people are proud of their service or they're, they just want to be tactical or whatever. I get it. And I'm not saying that's a wrong way to be if you're out on the farm with your buddies or something, but it's like... You know, you almost don't, you don't want to draw attention to yourself. Yep. So it's like when I travel, I take just some pedestrian looking suitcase that could look like any other suitcase. I don't take a tactical bag. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, yeah, I don't get the cool guy points for having the cool bag. But, 
yeah, you better believe that my suitcase is kitted out with a, you know, folding PCC with a couple of extra mags, a blowout kit, an extra pair of shoes, and then, of course, all my normal toiletries and clothing and things that I would normally bring. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I just want to mention, and maybe you agree with me, maybe not, because remember, this is more of a conversation about our overall collective uh, level of preparedness, right. and we can sort of learn from each other on this. What I like to do is if I know the trip is going to be maybe two or three days, I'll always pack uh, enough clothing for double the amount of time. Yep. I don't take three sets of clothes. I take six or seven sets of clothes. I always pack rain gear, and I pack way more socks than I'll ever need. That's like, you know, a, that's like a military thing though. We all pack like a ton of socks. Like when we go camping for like a week, we're like socks, gotta have yep. socks. <laughs> like lots of underwear, two, lots of socks, two pairs of pants, six shirts, 12 pairs of socks. Mm -hmm. And like, you're good. Like I, I will tell you, I don't bring as many pants as I do anything else. So like if, if we're going for like maybe three or four days, I might bring, I'll bring, I'll have the pants on. I'll bring one additional pair of pants but I'll bring like six or seven shirts because shirts, you know, they, they rip, they tear. Sure. I bring a ton. And they get dirty. Easy. Yeah. I bring a ton of socks because mm -hmm. you just never know. Socks are golden, man. You got to have socks. You know, a couple pairs of shoes and, you know, your toiletries. And, that, and that's pretty much set. You know, look, people might say I'm a little crazy for saying this, but I want to see what you, you think about this mindset. So not only do I pack more clothes than I know I'm going to need, mm -hmm. I will pack clothes that all look drastically different. In case I need to change my appearance, you know, I don't think about that. I, I just kind of, I just kind of bring. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that that's crazy, but I think that you know, it, it depending on where you're going. Like, if you're going to like a suburban area, yeah, that might work. But if I'm going to deer camp, yeah, I don't care. That's you right. <laughs> that's right. It, it it all is a matter of context and everything. But I don't mm -hmm. know. I just. I think it's important to just be prepared for any type of situation you might find yourself running into, you know, um, you know, like for boating, for instance, like when we're mm -hmm. out going fishing or something. I mean, I bring life jackets for dogs and infants. <laughs> That's true. It's you like, were like, even, check even out if my, my dog, my dog's life, my life jacket for yeah. my dog. I'm even like, if oh. a dog ain't with me, yeah. I've still got a life jacket for a canine. I've got a life jacket for an infant. Mm -hmm. I've got a life jacket for a toddler. Yep. Right. Well, we don't take infants out fishing. We usually don't take small children out fishing. Sometimes they want to go, but you never know if a child might need a life vest. And I just, I guess because of my level of preparedness, I just want to be prepared for every eventuality. Mm -hmm. I always carry dress clothes with me when I travel. You never know if you have to attend a funeral uh, or go have a business meeting and look sharp for the business meeting. So I, yeah. I travel with dress clothes that I have know, cause seen. I, I yeah. always just, I want to be ready in case a special occasion comes up. Yep. You never know. I might get to meet Ron Paul and go have dinner. Hey, Ron <laughs> I doubt <Paul>. that. But <laughs> <laughs> he probably didn't want to talk to me, but, but you know, I, I might have an, an opportunity while I'm out to, you know, hang out with somebody I really want to hang out with and I don't want to look like a rube, you know? So yeah. that's getting out of the bounds of, let's just say general preparedness and probably just more into my crazy little world of being overly prepared, yeah, you know? But everybody has their own little quirks, you know? And I mean, that it just depends on how you're, how you're traveling, where you're traveling, the distance you're traveling. Like me personally, I don't drive anywhere. I would say if it takes longer than, I would say 12 hours is probably my max, like mm. as far as driving goes. In um, one sitting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've driven. you drive 12 hours in one sitting? Oh, yeah. That's not a problem, man. Holy crap. Dude, I made it from Atlanta to Toronto in one shot. Like just one, one, boom, done. Got there. Dang, son. Yeah, man. How much coffee was involved in that trip? A lot. And I you will can't leave home without and your I coffee. Will, and I will tell you, going through the uh, mountains of like West Virginia was sketchy because I was tired. I had to open the windows, get that cold air going, but I was like, oh. But we made it. And, uh, you know, that that's pretty much my my limit. I don't like to stop and stay at hotels and, and all that stuff. Rest so, areas Yeah, are like, no, nah, I don't do any of that. So Especially if, with the kids. If man. I can get there in one shot, I most certainly will. And if it's longer than that, then I'll fly. That's right. You know? Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, point. You know that that's a very valid thing to bring up in this podcast as well. Is know your limits. Mm -hmm. You know, know your limits. 
when it comes to how long you can drive, where you're willing to go, uh, what your vehicle can take. I mean, look, you know, I get it. Like some trips can be really hard on certain vehicles. I mean, if you've got a, you know, old vehicle that's a little long in the tooth and, you know, a long trip might be a little hard on that old girl, you, <laughs> yeah. know, you might want to, might want to rethink it or, or consider flying or something, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, that, and that, that brings up another point is just having that, that preparation of, uh, you know, preventative maintenance and not in mm-hmm. a sense of like, Hey, I, I got to change my own oil and I have to, you know, make sure my antifreeze and my coolant's topped off. Like, yeah, you should. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're out there doing it yourself. I mean, this modern age, people will do it for you if you pay them. So you give them money <laughs> and then they do it for you at a reasonable rate. So yeah. I mean, it is know, important to know how to do it on your own. Though. It is, but with the newer vehicles, you still have to go in to have them reset the little engine light on an oil change. I could change my my oil all day, but I still have to take it into the dealership to have them make the little symbol go off. So why not just have them do it? I mean, it, okay, so good example. If I'm going to do an oil change in my car, it's going to cost me... $60, 60 to $70 in oil and oil filters. If I have it done at the dealership, it's about 90 And they reset the I think the it's worth to spend 20 bucks. I don't have to get up underneath the car on a creeper. I don't have to get, and I mean, we've all pulled an oil filter off a vehicle. And we every time we think, oh, it's not going to get me this time. It's not going to get me this time. <laughs> it gets you. Every You're time. gonna get a little. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's gonna get you. So pay the extra twenty or thirty bucks, have them do it, and you're good. But the most important thing is to get it done. So you, you those are the things you can't put off. You, you make sure your brakes are good. Make sure your engine is topped off with you know coolant with oil, because the I mean those are things that AAA isn't gonna be able to help you with. They can help you change a tire if you need that, but your engine goes out. You don't, you know, your engine oil was low and you, you burn up a head gasket and you float a piston, you crack a head. Yeah. Bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're a thousand miles from the house. Yeah. That's that's not the time you want to be having that issue. Exactly. I want to mention a couple of things about situational awareness. Again, getting back to this a little bit. And I guess everything that I always think about when I'm out on the road is about security and convenience. Those are really my two concerns, that and medical preparedness. Those Mm -hmm. are probably my three my trifecta, if you will, right? Yep. My situational awareness, my security, and my medical preparedness. Th- those are the three things. Th- yep. That's the holy trinity of survival when you're out on the road. And part of the situational awareness factor that I want to kind of talk about is, man, you see a lot of random stuff out on the road. You see people doing all kind of dumb stuff, oh, yeah. you know, trying to play with their phone and text and all this mess, and they're trying to yell at the kids and That's dangerous, right? You know, you don't want to get distracted. You want to try to make sure you can focus on the job of driving. So if you're out traveling with your significant other and your children, you know, probably have a little bit of a plan to where, you know, you have the conversation with your wife like, hey, you know, it's going to be on you while I'm driving to make sure that the child's good or that their needs are met or that, you know, you're helping me keep an eye out. I mean, just because you're a passenger in a vehicle doesn't mean that you are free from the job of helping the driver navigate, right? You are the navigator. You have an equal opportunity to see a potentially dangerous situation, someone about to hit you, someone change lanes at the wrong time, uh, whatever the case may be. Being a passenger does not absolve you from the responsibility of helping that driver navigate. And part of that is making sure that driver is not uh, distracted. Uh, Now, I will admit, when I'm on the road, I love to listen to music. I like to blare it loud. Oh, yes. And I listen to a lot of music. And I also like to handle business and take care of phone calls when I'm on the road. It's the best time to do it, you know? It is. Um, the, the one thing I would mention on that is, you know, obviously use your Bluetooth. Make sure you have a yes. Bluetooth stereo that can send your cell phone feed through your radio. And that way you have hands off. You know, you don't want to be trying to play with the phone and do all this mess with all the technology that's out there. Now there's absolutely no reason why you can't have Mm hands-free cell phone use and uh, allows you to concentrate on the task of driving. Now I will say this, it is easy to kind of daydream. It is. You get on the road, you're not thinking about it. You kind of get into autopilot you're talking on the phone with someone, having an in-depth conversation for 30, 45 minutes. Before you, I mean, think about how far you can drive your car in 45 minutes. Yeah. 
if you're not paying attention to the road signs or you're not paying attention to your GPS, you get turned around, you get lost. So you, you need to have not only your verbal judo in terms of having a conversation if you're going to handle business on the road, but you also want to make sure that your situational awareness does not mm-hmm. falter uh, in response to those things. Yeah, and I think you know using those hands-free tools, because um, in other states it obviously has different laws, but in Georgia it's actually against the law in Georgia to even have the phone in your hand while moving. So if you're in your car and you have your phone in your hand and you're using it, it doesn't matter what it's for. You're, and they see you, they can actually give you, they can cite you, they give you a ticket. So it's been a huge move in Georgia for everybody to move to hands-free. All the newer cars come with hands-free anyway. So there's really not an excuse for you to be doing that unless it's for, you know, you're programming your GPS or something like that. But it is interesting because it's funny you brought that up, Eric, because I was at the shop the other day and I got a phone call and it was uh, Matt from uh, Meet the Pressers. And he was just driving to Buffalo. He's like, hey, man, I was just flipping through my phone. And, you know, it's a long drive. And I hadn't talked to you in a while. I just wanted to catch up. So, I mean, people do that. You can conduct business on those longer drives because it's just basically you in the vehicle. And you're mm-hmm. just driving. So, I mean, it, it, it is you, you do need to take advantage of that time if you can. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to waste time. Yeah. You know, and honestly, it, it's it's hard for me in my everyday life sometimes to just blare the radio in the house and listen to music. I mean, I'm a huge music fan. I mean, you guys, mm-hmm. obviously, if you know me well enough, I, mean, I love all kinds of music. So sometimes it's hard to blare music in the house when you got stuff going on. And plus, we work from home, so I can't blare music and have, you know, bothering Brandy in the other room when she's trying to conduct business and that sort of thing. So, yep. you know, for me, when I'm on the road, that's my time to be able to blare my music as loud as I want. And I'll, I'll blare it so loud I'm shaking the windows out. Make sure whether it's loud music or whether it's a conversation related to business on the road or whatever you're doing, that it does not affect your situational awareness or or hurt your overall situational awareness. I mean, it's, it's never going to be perfect no matter what you do. Yep. If anything that distracts you is going to distract you, but don't let it distract you as best you can. You need to always think, hey, I'm driving first, I'm listening to music second. Yep. You know, put those things in order of importance and make sure that you're, you know, going about that in a methodical manner. Yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of times where, you know, you'll be out doing an event and I'll text you and say, hey, let me know when you're driving back from the event so we can, you know, talk business. And that's kind of like that perfect time of like, hey, I got nothing to do. I'm in the car so we can actually discuss because everything every other time we're we're all busy, you know, so it works out well. Um, a, cu- a couple more things I want to mention before we wrap up today's podcast. Uh, we've got just a few more minutes here left on today's podcast. Um, also, signal devices are pretty important to make sure you carry in your vehicle, too. I didn't really spend any time talking That's about that. That's a good point. I didn't mention that, but having a good flashlight is important. Mm-hmm. Um, I would recommend a good headlamp if you can. Uh, PowerTac makes an excellent headlamp. I've been using it religiously. We just filmed an entire bow hunt with it the other day. Uh, again, not to drop, but if you use the code IV8888, you can actually get up to a 30% discount depending on the SKU. What? So that's a way to save you some money there if you do want to get a flashlight. Signal devices are important. Um, also, chem lights, road flares, really important. Let's just say you do get broke down, you're on the side of the road, and you need to, let's just say, um, you know, divert traffic from your wreck, or, or if it, whether it's a wreck or a collision or whether it's just a simple uh, breakdown, it's late at night, it's dark, maybe you're on a rural route and people can't see that well. You don't want somebody flying up on you and hitting you when you're trying to change a tire or fix yep. a tire at night or something or deal with a tiny issue or something. Maybe you're having to top your cooling off or whatever, right? It could be anything. Uh, chem lights are great. Uh, some some places frown upon uh, road flares, right? They might not want road flares because they're worried about it getting knocked in the ditch and causing a fire or something, mm-hmm. or they think it actually distracts drivers too much. So you can do the big chem lights. Yep. You can do road flares. Personally, I carry both because you yep. just never know. Uh, you know, a T Rex might come out of the uh, <laughs> woods, and you need to, you know, do the whole hey. <laughs> but uh, I carry road flares and chem lights. And flashlights. So signal devices are a really important thing. Whether to signal for help, whether to light your way at night to light your path and see what you're doing. Headlamps are super useful. As I mentioned, the power tack, you're changing a tire, boop, turn it on, you got light. Uh, 
mm-hmm. so much easier. Plus, you don't want to have your wife or kid, get, you know, hey, hold the flashlight for daddy. Yeah. Now your kid's out there. It's dangerous. You know what I mean? I understand like wanting to get the kids involved in that because it's good life experience for them to learn to do those things. Not on the side of the road. But though. not on the side <laughs> of the road at night, right? So like having your own light source allows you to keep your kids, your wife in the vehicle safe, and they can be looking out, watching your back while you tend to business. So just something to consider signal. Yeah. And I I agree. I I think I'm more partial to using chem lights, but I love using the unnatural color chem lights. So like a green or a blue mm-hmm. or not red. I mean, those are colors that can be mistaken for reflective devices like road reflectors, white. You don't want to use white light on chem lights, but things that people automatically assume that's not normal. So green always stands out. So if you're, that's you, right. So if you're, you know, having if you've a, got your hazards on and yep. then throw those green ones out. Correct. Gonna, oh, okay, something's going on. Yeah, because they're gonna say, hey, green. That's not that's not a natural color for a road. Normally it's white, red, yellow, or orange, uh, but green immediately sets that off and you put three of those bad boys out like way down the road so people can see it and they know because when you see that green or if you see like something that's out of the ordinary you automatically slow down even if you don't see what it is so if you're if you're having road problems like engine problems or changing a tire walk down about 20 foot and put the chem lights out 20 foot 30 foot 40 foot away and then that way it's alerting those drivers before they get to you to slow down so by the time they see you they're like oh okay that's what that's what that was right um and i mean chem lights are super cheap you can buy them on amazon for like 50 cents a dollar for the small ones Mm -hmm. you can get the industrial size like the one foot ones for pretty inexpensive as well yep and they last forever you can crack a chem light from 10 years ago and it's still going to you know, illuminate like it's brand new. Yep. And, you know, a lot of the chem lights also have little hooks. Yes. So you might could even, you know, suspend one from a tree if you have to or to hang one off your vehicle. I mean, so there's tons of options mm-hmm. um, for illuminating, you know, things at night if you need to in, an, in a disaster situation. So, I mean, outside of some unique situations that some folks might find themselves in on their everyday travels, that pretty much covers, I believe, what to be the most important things you want to kind of consider when you're on the road. I mean, as we said, our trifecta. Yep. Right? Situational awareness, security, and medical preparedness. I think those are the three most important things because when we're at home, right, if someone got hurt, all right, say that someone, you didn't have a proper blowout kit at the house and someone had some bad bleeding. Well, what would you do to stop bleeding? You'd go run to the cupboard and grab a bunch of towels or something. Or, you know, mm-hmm. there's always something you can grab to use as a as a hasty medical aid, right, to yeah. stop bleeding. You're on the road. You don't have that luxury. So you have to have a little bit better planning to deal with those potentially disastrous situations. In the home, it's easy to get more complacent. But quite frankly, a well-equipped home, you can afford to be maybe a little more complacent yeah, you, than you can on the You road. have much more at your disposal as far as, you know, tools and equipment. Um, and I mean, I know we've kind of rammed home the idea of medical, but we it's because we have to. Because it doesn't get the same attention as all the other cool guy ninja stuff. And quite frankly, medical is just not as sexy as, you know guns or ammunition and carry and all this like body armor but it's probably yeah, john wick doesn't carry medical. yeah it's probably more important than any of them it's just that nobody has really figured out a way to make it you know to the forefront with medical everybody wants the other cool guy stuff but we're here to tell you carry medical i'm personally going to reevaluate my medical for my vehicle i think this podcast actually you know brought to light a lot of gaps in my system what i have and you know now i'm gonna have to go home and and uh, And, and you made me think about some things that i probably wouldn't have considered as well so that's why discussion is such an important thing it helps to kind of reconstitute your narrative of how you look at a certain situation that's why it's important to always reevaluate what you're doing there's always going to be a better way there might be somebody that's doing something that works better than what you're w- working with, and it might help you in your everyday situation. There might be something you're doing that's so amazing, like, wow, I wish I would have ever thought of that. That's a genius idea. So that's why a conversation about these subjects is so important. Thank you all so much for joining us this week. 
We had a great time on this particular podcast. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And maybe we uh, planted some little seeds in those brains of yours and, and got some seeds food in my for brain. thought going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you planted some in, in my head. Awesome. So it works. Yep. So uh, make sure you tune in every week here on LLP. Leave us a great rating over on all the podcast servers. It helps us show up in the search results a little bit better. Also, if you're watching here on the YouTube channel, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Down in the comment section, let us know, what are some of the things that you do when you are out and about in your everyday travels? And also, before we go, very quickly, I've got just a couple of minutes. I want to field, very quickly here at the end, a couple of Twitter questions. All right, let's Give me do two it. seconds. I love this. All right, I got you. I wanted to do it earlier, and it honestly slipped my mind. Yeah. But some of the folks who uh, you know engage with us on a regular basis on Twitter, uh, if you go over to um, at Iraq Veteran eighty eight eighty eight on a Twitter desk. All right. So we got a few responses here. So the question that I posed, I said, Matt and I are recording LLP podcast today. I'd like to pose a question to our Twitter audience. What are some considerations you make when taking a long trip? Is it Road guns, blowout kits, etc. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. All right. George Rice says, I have always had one of my military issue wool blankets behind the seat of my truck. Oh, In the winter, yeah. it could keep you from freezing and it's handy for treating shock there at an go. accident. And it could be used in very many different ways. So see, he pretty much lines up with what we said about shock and everything. Be prepared. All right. Let's see. Most all right. So uh, A.K. John Mahaney Mahaney says most of my trips consist back east with terrible anti Second Amendment gun law states to the point that my concealed carry permit isn't any good. Yes, right. So I don't bring a gun, a small knife at best. Definitely pray to the criminal's thirst. If I have my choice, my Glock forty eight and my Mark eighteen. Dang. Wow. That's some heavy that medicine, man. <laughs> all right. So Dad Tactics says a blowout. Tool, travel kit, snacks and drinks to appease the kiddos, That's right. tablets to keep the are we there yet questions at bay, and guns and ammo and first aid kit. Okay? Good. So pretty much a synopsis of this entire podcast oh, yeah. from Dad Tactics. Derek says, tools, blankets, water, snacks, slash emergency food. Jacob Stark says, survival bag with essentials for rain, water filtration, fire starting. See, I mentioned the Blackbeard yeah. fire starter. And other knickknacks, rifle, War belt. War belt. And a pistol set up as well. All right. Let's see. Zero Jaeger. My wife and I have a just-in-case that has road flares and limited uh, first aid kit. I got it all at Walmart. It has jumper cables as well. And also have my hunting knife just in case. Ah, oh, we didn't mention jumper cables. Yeah. Make that's sure a big you got one. jumper cables. Yeah. They also make those rechargeable jumper boxes too, which would probably be a handy yeah. thing to have. They work if, very well, by the way. I've used it. If you have room. All right, let's see. Michael says, uh, I bring walking shoes, a sleeping bag, my CCW, usually an AR pistol, a plate carrier, a map, and a power bank to charge my phone. Also, water and some snacks. All right, that's sensible. Yeah. Um, wow, there's a lot of comments here. Yeah. I appreciate everybody who fielded a question or a comment there on Twitter. Thank you so very much. I just wanted to acknowledge a few of you. Have a great week. Many more podcasts on the way. Thanks for tuning in to LLP. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Life, Liberty, and Pursuit. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. Be sure to leave us a five-star review. We'd really appreciate that. You can support us over on Ballistic Inc. by picking yourself up some merch. And remember, guys, dangerous freedom. Have a good one.